Today is the day before Election Day, November 7th, 2016. I have no idea how long these lectures are going to be up. We're going to be looking at the kings of Egypt, and there's kind of a mistaken idea that all the kings in Egypt were called pharaohs. That's actually not the case. We don't call them pharaohs until what we call the New Kingdom, so we won't even get to that today. The first, first, first kings of Egypt were kings, and they were the quintessential example of the divine right to rule. So it's rather fitting that it's the day before Election Day now, because these kings sought to preserve their memory and their dynasty for all eternity. And the earliest ones we're going to be looking at are somewhere around 2800 BCE or before Common Era or so. So I leave it to you, oh, listener. We are remembering and speaking of these kings 5,000 years later, and it doesn't appear that their artwork or their statues are going to disintegrate anytime soon. I wonder how long the memory of the turmoil that's happening in history on this day that I'm recording in digital form for you as a superimposition, if you will, to a subject matter that's much, much older but in many ways parallel, will last. Will someone be listening to this in 10 years? Or will it all just be deleted in six months? I don't know. I speak to you, I have no idea. I may never meet you or see you, but I speak of these things that are ancient and ideals that are as old as humanity. So that being said, let's go to Egyptian art one, and we're gonna start with Neolithic and pre-dynastic Egypt, and then go through a place called Saqqara in the Old Kingdom of Egypt. Okay, so Egypt drew the admiration of the ancients, meaning Greeks, the Romans, they all traveled to Egypt. They traded with Egyptians. Probably the Minoans did. You'll, you haven't seen the Minoan culture yet. You haven't seen the culture of the Caribbean yet. We have traveled up as late as Alexander the Great in the previous lecture. The Egyptians were powerful and they had influence throughout the Mediterranean region, although they didn't conquer that far. But their culture faded away and became forgotten after the fall of the Roman Empire and even a little before. And it remained somewhat forgotten until the 18th century, at which time we had the rise of science and the age of the Enlightenment. And so 18th century scholars in the age of the Enlightenment, at the birth of science, at which time science was a time of cataloging. It was a time when Descartes wrote the dictionary and we had Linnaeus. We had this idea of counting, this idea of categorizing. And so when armies traveled, which Napoleon of course did travel to Egypt, they went with the army and they discovered lots of ancient monuments buried and they discovered the first tombs, they discovered sculptures, and they discovered the Rosetta Stone, which meant that they could discover hieroglyphics. And so because they had something specific to study, it became a field of study. Now the Egyptians invented their own calendar. And that was because they needed to establish a chronological sequence of time. We've looked at Stonehenge, and if you recall, Stonehenge is like a big calendar, right? And we talk about the difference between an early culture that, fo that is a hunter-gatherer culture that might follow the cycles of the moon, and then maybe later they're following the cycles of the sun. And so for the Egyptians, it's a little bit different. They're following the cycle of the Nile. They're following the fact that the Nile rises and floods and then fades away at different times of the year and their agriculture is deeply dependent on this. So unlike the ancient Near East and that fertile crescent that's between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, 
in which, as you recall, they're dependent on irrigation, the Egyptians actually work with the rise and flow of the Nile, and they develop some irrigation systems too, but it's heavily dependent on the soil that's deposited each year. So their new year begins when the Nile begins to rise. And as you're probably already surmising, this isn't necessarily completely regular. It might not always be exactly the same time of year. And so they needed to find a little bit more reliable system their solution was to find the rising of the star Sirius. And the Egyptians called Sirius Sothis, who was a goddess who always appears in the sky on our calendar, July 17th, which is a Roman calendar. And that was pretty much always right around the time of the rising of the Nile. So that became the beginning of their new year. So the Egyptians had three seasons not four, and there were four months in each season and 30 days in each month. So they actually had 365 days in their year too. Isn't this interesting, all these cultures that end up with 365 days? They added in five extra ones for religious observance. So here's an overview, and ancient Egypt goes over a long time, so it's divided into several sections, so you'll sort of see this overview again. The first lecture that I'm doing right now covers Neolithic and pre-dynastic Egypt. And then the early dynastic Egypt, we start looking at some symbols and the palette of Narmer, representation of the human figure. So all of that is before the actual establishment of the dynasties and their funerary architecture, which begins with the Old Kingdom sculpture and tomb decoration. You've already discovered about me that I love maps. So here's a big map. This is the big picture of where we are. There's Spain way over here. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the ancient Near East where we were just were. Here's Great Britain, Stonehenge is up here. And the Lascaux Cave is over here. Altamira Cave is up here. Here's the Tigris and Euphrates River. Here's the Babylon, Uruk, and Ur, where we just were. And Persepolis is over here. The Red Sea is here. And here is the Nile River. And the ancient Egypt that we're going to look at is in this little tiny section of the Nile. And Egypt itself, of course, is much bigger than that. You know, it, it goes down below where my cursor's going. Look down by where the Red Sea is and you can see Thebes. And this really, if you look at a whole map of the world, it gets even smaller. Egypt is in the top of Africa. So here's Africa. So here's little tiny Nile. Well, not so little tiny really, but compared to all of Africa, it's little. It's the longest river in the world. And Egypt is this little box right here. The Nile runs through Egypt and all the way through Sudan and all the way here, it, it originates in Lake Victoria. It's, here's a little bit bigger map of it that you can see. In prehistoric times, it was very hot. It was very humid. There was lots of forests, steppe land, and oases, but the climate changed. And so now we're talking pre-dynastic, Neolithic, before Egyptian history, this long, long period of prehistoric times in which there's this slow climactic change. I love to say this, climate change isn't new to the 21st century. Climate change is as old as humanity. And there was climate change there. Now there's desert, then there were forests, steppe land, oases, and so, as the climate change, people migrated out of the areas in the desert that used to be fertile, and they settled all along the banks of the Nile. So they moved out of you know, the other parts of Africa and went where the water was, of course. So the Nile flows in this kind of a opposite, backward idea, because when we look at a map, you know, we see the top of the map, but the Nile is actually flowing from the bottom of the map to the top of the map. So we call the part of the top of the map Lower Egypt, because that's the end of the Nile where the Nile Delta is, where it flows out into the Mediterranean. And every year it rises in July, at right around that July 17th date that we just talked about, and the land just gets 
filled with water, this huge flood, which leaves all this mud that's come all that way, all those thousands of miles down from the heart of Africa. And then once those flood waters recede, they sow their crops and then they have the harvest. This slide talks about the Nile, and the Nile is actually, it's two rivers. There's the White Nile that forms up in Lake Victoria, and then the Blue Nile rises over here in the mountains of Ethiopia. And then north of Khartoum, it enters ancient Nubia. This is where the desert begins. And at six points, it passes over outcrops of rock, which are known as the cataracts. And at the northernmost cataract, the Nile enters lower Egypt at Aswan. And there's a dam there now. In about 3,150 years before Common Era, King Menes united Upper Egypt, which again is the south, from Nubia down to around here, with Lower Egypt, which is in the north. So we're still, this is just the cusp. So we're still in pre-dynastic Egypt now. Their god, their Nile god was named Happy. And Happy was this personification of the Nile. So this was a big thing for King Menes to unite the two halves of Egypt into one land. And he based this on the fact that the Nile is one God, that the river, and the river was the source of all life. So all Egypt, upper and lower Egypt, really should be one land. And this is a hymn to happy. The fact that we have this poem, this poem of love to this God of the Nile, this worshipfulness toward the source of all life, toward providing, seeking, you know, bounty to the poor, conquering. He's gracious. You know, when he plunders, the whole land rages, food provider. This, the Nile creates all that is good. But so it's, brings peace, but it brings danger too. So we see from the earliest times, from just this idea of the unification of the Nile, this Nile God, happy, this hymn to happy, that from the earliest, earliest ages that the Egyptians have a deep connection with the land and with their gods of the land as the source of all life. And religion is very, very important to the Egyptian people. More, you know, it's it's impossible for us to imagine how important it was. It was, they, they lived and breathed their religion and their life in the afterlife. They believed that there was supernatural powers in every single everyday object. They had all kinds of complicated signs and symbols for them. And we learn about this again from the Rosetta Stone. And this, of course, the religion and the symbolism and all of that changes. I mean, we have a culture here that's going for 3,000 years. You know, if, we, if you think about our culture, it's 2,100 years from the birth of Christ. You can think how many changes have been since then. So take 3,000 years and genera generations and generations of humans, and you can imagine. But certain things remain the same. And one is that animals remain very important. Animals end up being represented as deities who act as intermediaries. It's really obvious that the Egyptians saw, as they saw the process of growth and decay, it created this construction of life after death. They saw the Nile as that dividing line between the east and the west, between the rising and the setting sun between the living and the dead. So they believed that the land of the dead must be where the setting sun sinks. But they imagined a whole underworld underneath the Nile that was exactly like the land above the Nile. So after you died, you went into this underworld and you just kept living things just stayed the same so it was really important that after you died you had all the stuff you needed to go on living the way that you would want to live so their religion was polytheistic had many gods they could appear in both human and animal form or a combination and often their rulers were gods depending on the periods of time during the egyptian history in prehistoric Egypt, they were pretty much local gods. It was very animistic religion. 
But after 3000, the status of the gods is influenced by politics. So a pantheon is all the gods of a people. And another thing is that the Egyptians had no problem absorbing gods of other cultures. And again, this is one reason why they were so powerful, and it's a well-known law of history, law of conquering, that if you assimilate the culture of other people or if you transform the culture of another people, if you're invading another land, if you bring your cultures to that land or if you assimilate their culture, it helps you gain power. This process is known as a syncretism. So for them, death is the transition to a similar existence on another plane. You're physically preserved, you have possessions, you have stuff to eat, you have sustenance, and images can substitute for a preserved body to hold the ka or spirit. So even if you don't have the money to make a mummy, you can make a picture of yourself, or perhaps if you have the wherewithal to make a statue that'll last forever, you could have that, and that would hold your ka or your spirit. The Egyptians believed that there were three parts to the spirit. There was your ka, which is your life force. It continues after death. And as you'll see, the deceased um, can eat, they can drink offerings. Priests will come to ka statues of various deities and give them new clothes every day and give them food every day and wash them every day, things like that. Now the Ach is a part of the spirit that's detached from the body. It resides in the heavens as a spiritual transformation. So there's always this link. And then there's the Ba that's literally in touch with the deceased. And the living had to provide for the dead. The dead would need pallets, cosmetics, jewelry, clothing, servants, weapons, utensils. And all of these objects, and they could be reproductions on the wall, or it could be the actual objects themselves, or a combination of both, which is usually what happened. They had magic forces, and they went into the next world with the deceased, and they would put very great deal of their energy and time into buying things and saving stuff to put in their tomb so that their life and eternity would be comfortable. All of their deeds, all of their thoughts, their settlements, cities were disappeared, but the mortuary temples and tombs, the places where the dead were, were what survived. And isn't this interesting? As I was, this is kind of where that philosophical flight of fancy that I went into at the beginning of this lecture kind of comes from is they paid no attention to what they stored up on earth for themselves on earth, but they paid a great deal of attention to what their spirits would have in the afterlife that they might live forever. And we come and we find them now. Most of what we know about their lives comes from representations in their tombs, funerary gifts, inscriptions. We have temples too, as we'll see later. But for these ancient, ancient ones, we have tombs. This slide has a chart that is also in the fourth edition of the textbook. I don't know whether this chart is in the fifth edition, so I want to make sure you all had this chart. It has the names of all the gods and what they do. If you ever look on your own and you see a representation of a god, you could find him in this chart. Some of them will talk about Imhotep. We're going to see him. He was the architect of the step period and pyramid in Saqqara. Horus is identified with the king during his life. We are going to see him on the head of the king. Here's Happy, the god of Nile. So as in Mesopotamia, there's this common challenge of controlling the river's flow. So yes, they do allow the rise and fall of the river to guide their calendar but they also need to control the water to get the maximum crop growth. So the larger states settle around different areas where they're irrigating or where they're getting water, where they're growing crops. Their Neolithic culture actually began around 5,500 BCE. So we're looking at mm, almost 8,000 years ago that they began settling there that we have early remains from. By 3,500, they've built larger states. So we call the pre-dynastic period. Neolithic culture begins in 5,500. And so 
1500 later, years later, we do start having larger states. So the pre-dynastic period goes from 3500 to 3100, which is this transitional period, this new dimension of leadership and rulers start claiming divine powers. So that's what's important about this. Now, one other point that this slide is expressing is the fact that subjects expected their rulers to be able to control the natural environment as well as the political environment. So even though we really haven't started dynastic Egypt yet, we're already setting ourselves up for some interesting problems. This is an image of a jar. It's from 3500 to 3400, so it's right around the cusp between the Neolithic and the pre-dynastic age. The first settled communities are sort of joining together and there's this very powerful political authority and the imagery on this jar, you can see this boat, it's got two cabins and two oars and a fertility goddess on the top of the left cabin. She's larger, she's got triangular shapes, she's got her arms extended over her head and as we've discussed, the Niles associated with fertility. So this is an early, early image of the way that Egyptian people are thinking about this. Most of the surviving art that we have from this pre-dynastic period is ceramic figures, pottery, reliefs, and this is from a place called Hyrad Copolis in the Upper Kingdom. It was a mud brick town about 100 acres big. If you look at the little zigzags, you can see the water of the Nile, and then there's a boat floating and vertical strokes sort of showing the motion of the oars. As I've stated, the actual Egyptian history begins with the unification of the kingdom by Menes around 2950 BCE, so about 500 years after that little jar we just looked at was made. I know I keep saying this, but it's very important that you kind of try to constantly remind yourself about the long spans of time between these different images that we're seeing, just the span of time that this culture is growing over and how many generations it encompasses. There's basically two Egypts. There's Upper Egypt, where the river valley is only a few miles wide. And there's barren mountains, very mountainous, very like cliffs on both sides. There's some cataracts. But then Lower Egypt in the Delta, the river is very broad. It's very flat and sandy. So of course, they lived a little bit different way. There's geographical differences, just means they have different kinds of houses and things like that. So there's two sets of symbols for Upper and Lower Egypt. And your textbook has a really good illustration and explanation of these different symbols. And I'm gonna unpack a few of them in the next few slides. So we're gonna spend a little time looking at this object. It's called the Narmer Palette. If you look at this list of dynasties, this is a list we use today. And so the Narmer palette, when from the time of Menes consolidation, is named after this first king named Narmer. So Narmer is dynasty one, and he ruled around 3100 BCE. So modern scholars say we have the pre-dynastic period, which we just looked at, and then early dynastic, which begins with Narmer and the few kings before the Old Kingdom. Then we have the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. And then last, we have the Late Dynastic Period. So here is the palette of Narmer. And what is this thing? Okay, because we think of a palette. We think of a palette as the thing we can mix paint on, which is actually what this is. If you see the little circle between those two serpopars, which are snake-headed leopards, that is a place where they would mix eye paint. So that's what the function of this object is. And the image on this side of the palette is a picture of Narmer. And this palette is made out of mudstone or shale. And the carving is what's called low relief. So if you recall, low relief is just very, very lightly etched out. So the figures are just raised up a little bit and his name is on both sides in a little tiny square at the top. There's a horizontal fish 
right on top of a vertical chisel. So that's how we know his name, Nar Mer, a fish over a chisel. So there are links between divine and earthly power here. And this is an example, again, of what's called Machtkunst, or as we say, the German word for power or a, a powerful object or art that is meant to create some kind of very powerful propaganda. It's a statement of power. It's celebrating the king's right and ability to rule. So Narmer is the biggest figure on this. And so the size and the fact that he's in the middle shows how important he is. And this is also showing us the convention for the way that Egyptians will show the human body for the next couple thousand years. So it's kind of no body could actually stand the way this is shown. If you look at the way he's twisting and turning, and I'll talk more about this, but he's turned to the side, his head's turned to the side, both his eyes are on the side of his head, and the, but then you can see the insides of both feet. It's absolutely a conceptual way of showing the body rather than realistic. And he's, you can see he's threatening a kneeling em enemy. He's got him by the hair and he's holding a mace over his head. He's getting ready to bash him or do something to him. So he's conquest, his domination. And there's a servant behind him holding his sandals. So he's on holy ground that you would only go barefoot on holy ground. And then Horus, who is the god of the sky and the kingship, he's got a captive human-headed creature at the end of the rope. The papyrus is representing Lower Egypt. So Horus is dominating symbols of the Lower Egypt as a parallel of Narmer, who's crowned as the king of the Upper Egypt. And all the bull's tails from his waistband show strength. There's many other symbols there too. And so on the other side, Narmer's shown at the top, and again, he's the biggest figure, and he's wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt. So this palette shows him wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt and the red crown of Lower Egypt on each side. And here he's marching behind the Minister of State and four men carrying standards, and then all of his, his conquered enemies are there. You can see them on the right-hand side. And many scholars think that the two surface parts, which are surrounding the place where the eye paint would be mixed, um, are showing the unification of Egypt. Now, the Egyptians had what's called a canon of proportion. And you'll see this again in Greek art. A canon of proportion is a conceptual approach to the human figure. It's a slightly abstract way of showing the human figure by a certain set of rules for a specific reason. And the thing it shows about the Egyptians, the fact that they have this canon of proportions, shows that they are conceptual thinkers. So one thing that's very important about this, and the reason I'm sort of showing you the same thing in several slides in a row, is because it's an object that uses pictographs and symbols to make a point, and it shows the way the early Egyptians depicted the human form. So there's so much information in here going forward. All of Egyptian art is created for royal patrons. So a patron is the person that buys the art. Where does art come from? An artist needs to eat food, he needs material, so somebody's gotta buy it, somebody's gotta give him something. So in order to purchase art, you have to be a person that is in such a place of society that you have extra resources to put toward that artwork. And as we've already seen in this lecture, we know how important an image of ourselves is going to be in the afterlife because we're going to need our servants, we're going to need our Ka image, we're going to need a place for the Ka to reside, we're going to need everything else that we have in life. So it's important that this is very rigidly defined so that the spirits can understand where and who we are. So they use what's called a memory image to show each body part in a characteristic way. It's like a a map, if you will. And do this at home. You look at this picture and try to stand the way this person is standing. And then you could maybe play that song by the Bandles, Walk Like an Egyptian. But, you know, it's, it's, it, they probably looked at this picture and went, oh my goodness. But you can't do it because if you look at the way the 
shoulders are turned and the hips are turning, but yet the legs, see the way the knee is in profile? And then we have the inside of the back foot and we also have the inside of the front foot. So they would have had to take the foot right off the leg and turn it around and stick it there. And here's the profile, but the whole eye is on the profile. And if you ever look at a profile of a person, you, you know that you wouldn't see the entire eye. That would mean the whole eye would be, have to be on the side of your face. This is because eyes are the most expressive when seen from the front. So the figure is looking right out at the viewer by having this eye placed here. And these are very prescribed ratios. If you superimpose a grid over any of them, you'll find that they do them all the same for the next several thousand years. And this image, you're going to see this again later in the tomb of Saqqara, but it's a low relief of sculptors at work. And you can clearly see the insteps, the canon of proportions, the size of the shoulders, the twisting and turning of each. Even, the, even this guy here, you know, they're creating this walking figure. You can see they've got their chisels in their hands, but they're standing in this posture.